Now, before we move on, let me just remind you that what we're doing here is still part of the backstory of why anyone would take seriously the idea that your brain is a computer and that thinking is a computational process. What I'm trying to do with the previous video and this one is set up a scientific problem for which we can then introduce the computer model as offering at least a partial solution to that problem. And just to clarify again, I'm not defending this model here. I'm just trying to explain the motivations for it. We've looked at dualism and what I've called the no ghosts in the machine condition. Now let's move on to our second condition on a scientific theory of the mind, which I called follow the flow of reasons. This is the notion that any theory of the mind has to come up with a way of showing how a physical system can be a reason following system, where the dynamics of the physical system is governed not just by physical forces, but also by the flow of reasons. The example I used in the introduction was very simple. I notice rain clouds, that leads me to check the weather app in my smartphone, and then I grab my umbrella and raincoat before heading out the door. It's a simple example, until you remember that what we're trying to do is figure out the best way to explain this behavior in physical or naturalistic terms. If we're looking for a causal explanation, what caused me to move in this way, to pick up the cell phone, to check the weather app, and so on. And we think that causal explanations are ultimately grounded at the smallest biophysical level then there's a story we can imagine that would apply at that level. The pattern of photons emitted by the clouds entered my eyeball and struck the back of my retina, creating a pattern of stimulation across the rods and cones of the retina, which creates a chain of bioelectrical impulses that travel along my optic nerve into the deeper visual processing centers of my brain, which triggers other patterns of neural activation, which eventually result in nerve impulses traveling to my spinal cord and outward to my limbs, causing muscles to contract and relax in a coordinated way, causing me to reach into my pocket to remove my cell phone, and so on and so forth. Think of a causal mechanical story like this, extended through the whole duration of the action sequence. It involves trillions of neurological and biomechanical components interacting in a coordinated way. And let's grant, for the sake of argument, that there is a true story of this kind, at this level of description, that accounts for the movement of my body through space and all its various behaviors, like pressing icons on the iPhone, reading the text on the screen, grabbing the umbrella, and so on. We don't have access to this causal story, of course. It's not possible for us to track all of these trillions of causal interactions. But we can imagine a God's eye view of the situation where all the details are present and accounted for. Now imagine that we have this complete causal mechanical explanation in our hands. Now here's the question. Would this be an adequate explanation for my actions? You might think so, but remember, at this level of description, we're not appealing to concepts like beliefs and desires. We're talking about basic, low-level physical interactions that you can empirically measure and study. There's a long-standing view in cognitive science that this kind of explanation, as attractive as it might be in some respects, does not provide an adequate explanation for my behavior. There are several reasons for this, but one of the most important has to do with the fact that part of what it means to understand this kind of behavior is to understand not only what did happen, but also what would have happened under slightly different conditions. For example, what if I saw the rain clouds and went to my phone, but the weather app wasn't working? Let's say I look at the phone, put it back in my pocket, and then turn on the TV to the local news channel to check the weather report. Now, at a neurological and biomechanical level, this sequence of events will be very different from the first one. And now, let's ask ourselves this question. If all you had access to was that original causal mechanical sequence, as complex and complete as it was, on the basis of that alone, could you have predicted how I would behave if the iPhone app wasn't working? Could you have predicted that I might proceed to turn on the TV to check the local news channel? Would that behavior make any sense to you? There seems to be only one answer to this question. You could only have predicted these alternative behaviors if you understood my behavior as an action that flows from a set of beliefs and desires that I have, and inferences that I'm able to draw from those beliefs and desires. When I saw dark clouds, I inferred that they carried rain. I believe that rain will make me wet and uncomfortable if I'm not protected from it. I want to avoid this. I want more information about the likelihood that it will rain today. I believe that the weather app on my phone can provide this information. I believe that I can receive information about the weather from the local TV news. I believe an umbrella and a raincoat can keep me from getting uncomfortably wet. 
I judge that the probability of rain is high enough that it warrants me taking the umbrella and raincoat with me, and so on. When you interpret my behavior as issuing from beliefs and desires and reasoning processes like these, the alternate scenario, where I put the phone back in my pocket and turn on the TV to check the weather, makes perfect sense. And this reasoning applies to an indefinite number of alternate behaviors that would all make sense if you understood my actions as issuing from a particular network of beliefs and desires and other mental states, and the logical inferences, the reasoning transitions that I can make on the basis of those states. This is what it means to say that my behavior follows the flow of reasons and not just a sequence of mechanical causes. Now, let me be clear. The claim that's being made here isn't that we can ignore the causal mechanical story going on at the micro level. If there's any chance of building a machine that can behave this way, obviously we'll need to pay attention to the causal mechanical story. The claim is rather that the micro level isn't the right level of description to really understand this kind of intelligent behavior. You've got to move to a higher level of description, a more abstract level of description, the level where it makes sense to talk about the content of beliefs and desires and mental states, to get an explanation of human behavior that is genuinely useful and predictive. And it turns out, this is our default mode of explanation when we're interpreting and explaining ordinary human behavior. This is the mode that we've evolved to use. So this approach suggests that, no matter how complex or strange the ultimate causal story ends up being, a science of the mind will somehow have to stay in touch with at least some aspects of the ordinary way we talk about human psychology. In our final science of the mind, it will still make sense to say that, at least in some cases, Kevin did what he did because he believes A, B, and C, and he wants to achieve X, Y, and Z. In our theory, these common sense psychological categories need to be represented in a way that shows how intelligent behavior can be guided by reasons. Now, I always worry when I teach this topic that half my audience thinks this is absolutely obvious and trivial and is wondering what the big deal is. But this really is a big deal. It's a big deal because when you combine the two conditions that we've talked about over the past two videos, the condition that intelligent beings like us are ultimately physical systems, and our behavior is the result of the organization and functioning of a physical system, and the condition that intelligent beings like us are reason-governed systems, that our behavior results from the way we represent the world to ourselves, and the way we reason with those representations. When you combine these two conditions, you're defining the parameters of a research program that is fundamentally different from and more challenging than anything else we've ever attempted in modern science. You think physics is hard? Physics is trivial compared to this. Chemistry and biology are trivial compared to this. In none of these fields do you have to worry about how a physical system can seemingly be motionless, yet it be actively updating and transforming its mental states so that it can then determine how it will move based on the content of those mental states. This research program assumes that intelligent beings like us have a special dual nature. We are physical systems made exclusively of physical stuff, yet we are also reason-respecting and reason-guided systems. And it's not obvious at all how this coordination came about, or even how it's possible. In the next video, we're going to dig in a little deeper and explore some issues in the philosophy of mind and language to show why this problem is even more challenging than it appears at first glance.